again. Welcome uh, to General Slight this morning. Um, busy and uh, an opportunity to get his perspective on the worldwide fight he's constantly engaged in, as are his, his 21,000 personnel. Uh, while the drawdown in Afghanistan has offered the opportunity for somewhat of a reset, uh, my guess is you're going to be as busy as ever. Uh, no slowdown uh, for Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, but before we dig too deep into uh, what everyone wants to get at, and that's your perspective, let me take the opportunity to thank our sponsors. Uh, the Air and Space, the AFA Air and Space Warfighters in Action series and episodes are made possible by the support of our sponsors. So BAE Systems, Collins Aerospace, Dell, Elbit Systems of America, General Dynamics, Mission Systems, Google Cloud, Gulfstream, L3 Harris, Lockheed Martin, Oracle Cloud, Pratt & Whitney, Raytheon Technologies, Rebellion Defense, SAIC, and the Roosevelt Group. Well, Jim, uh, as we know, Air Force Special Operations Command is at a strategic inflection point. You must be able to maintain pressure on violent extremist organizations while also preparing for conflict with peer adversaries. And as Secretary Kimball says over and over, it's all about China. And while he always says, uh, reviewing the classified information is daunting, I would uh, reaffirm on his behalf uh, that we have never seen a peer military threat uh, like China and the China military has evolved to over the past few years. Well, General Slife has spent the majority of his career in special operations aviation assignments, and like the rest of his force, has been constantly deployed. Since taking command in June 2019, he's overseen the drawdown in Afghanistan and helped set the command on a new path for the future fight. And if you read his strategic guidance, focused on people, human capital, over and over. So welcome, Jim, uh, and over to you. I'll start with just a broad question, but we can take uh, this next hour or so in any direction you'd like. And again, we can't thank every one of you all who I know are busy for being here today, and we'll have time for questions and some interactions uh, during this uh, approximate hour together. So to start, how is AFSOC preparing to make the shift from asymmetric warfare the asymmetric warfare it's conducted in the Middle East over the last several dec decades to competition with peer or near peer adversaries like Russia or China. Well, it, first, thanks for giving me the opportunity to join you today. And uh, it's good to see uh, some familiar faces in the audience. Good morning uh, to each of you. Um, you know, I thought uh, when you and I spoke in your office before we walked in here, I thought you said you were going to start off with a softball question. Or something. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I feel a little bit, uh, I feel a little um, betrayed here. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, Sorry. Uh, in all seriousness, it, it really is, you use the term strategic inflection point. And that's the way we talk about it. And, you know, I think there have been three of those since the end of the Vietnam War. The first was in April of 1980 uh, in the desert south of uh, Tehran, when we realized the force that we had was not really the force that we were going to need. Uh, so we built that force. It took, um, you know, better part of two decades to, to do that. The second one uh, was in September of 2001, where once again, we found that the force that we had was not really the force that we were going to need for the, uh, for the strategic environment as it as it was emerging. And I think we're at a third one where the counter VEO force that we have built and employed for the last 20 years is not necessarily the same force that we're going to need to confront the pacing challenges of the security environment of the next couple of decades. And so, you know, the question is, how do you go about this change, particularly in an era of uh, what we expect to be fairly flat or perhaps declining uh, budgeting for the special operations forces. Uh, over the last several budget cycles, uh, we, we have seen a decline in our, uh, in our spending power, and it, it not inappropriately so. I mean, that, uh, that's to be expected. But the question is, how do you reposture yourself with, when you don't have a, uh, an open checkbook with which to do it? And I think for us, the answer is you, you take stock of, of what you have and you think about how you can use it a little differently. The analogy that I use is, um, you know, in the in the Slife household, sometimes uh, at dinner time we know what we want, and so we go to the grocery store, we get a buggy, and we fill up the buggy with you know a ribeye steak and the baked potato and key lime pie and a bottle of wine, and we go ring it up. And but more often than not, in the Slife household. Uh, at dinner time, we go and open the refrigerator and we stand there and stare. Uh, and then we open the cabinet next to the refrigerator and we stare. 
And we look at the ingredients that we have and we figure out how to make different recipes with the ingredients we've got. And so we've got some great ingredients in the Air Force Special Operations Command. Obviously, uh, the, the most powerful ingredient we have, and you alluded to it, is the airmen uh, that make up the command. Um, we, we've really got a, a fantastic force. And I, I don't know that we're any different than uh, any place else in the Air Force, but I will say that, you know, clearly our airmen are a competitive advantage. And so how do we empower those airmen? And, and you alluded to that. Uh, it's really the heart of our strategic guidance. Uh, the second great ingredient we've got is we've got some really um, fantastic platforms, not without, not without our challenges uh, in some of them, of course, but, you know, AFSOC has the youngest fleet of aircraft inside the entire Air Force of all the MAGCOMs are, are you know, um, our aircraft are, are the youngest. And so we've got, you know, plenty of service life left. We have, you know, they're multi-role platforms. We can use them a little differently. And so I'm sure at some point we'll talk about uh, last December, we launched a, a JASM out of the back of a, a C-130 um, using a palletized munitions uh, capability. That, that's something that's probably worth digging into a little bit. Uh, we, you know, we're um, going through uh, some testing right now on an amphibious modification for C-130s. And so, you know, if uh, it, it, it's been 30 years since I studied aerospace engineering, but what I can, you know, recall from my time uh, as an engineering student is if you were going to build an amphibious airplane, you probably wouldn't start with a C-130. Uh, <laughs> but the C-130 is the ingredient that we have in the cupboard. And uh, we've got a pretty um, compelling uh, digital design uh, that's going to give us the ability to turn the, you know, any large body of water uh, into a landing zone where we can insert, extract, um, special operations forces and equipment and uh, other things that, that might cause dilemmas for our adversaries. So uh, really kind of an exciting time, but, um, but not without its challenges, particularly in a, in a flatter declining resourcing environment. Well, great, uh, great start. Jim, could you talk, and you already brought it up, uh, talk about two things. One is a uh, JASM launch from the C-130, Insight that may not be out there already. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, obviously it's unclassified, but but ranges and and potential and how you're looking at the future um, for um, not just a niche capability, but maybe an expanded capability. And then the other thing I'd really like to talk to you about, and I want to go on record to volunteer to fly your new armed Overwatch aircraft. That sounds like a terrific mission. Yeah, it's and, be a lot uh, of fun. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited about that. So on the uh, on the. JASM, uh, General Minahan invited me to the AMC WEPTAC outbrief a few weekends ago and uh, gave me an opportunity to talk to his weapons officers and his staff and so forth. And one of the points that I made was I think <clears throat> as airmen, one of the things that we, we tend to do is we get affixed by our prefixes. We get affixed by our prefixes. And so, you know, what do we do with airplanes that start with B? We drop bombs. What do we do with airplanes that start with C? We carry cargo. What do we do with airplanes that start with an F, right? And so we put these prefixes and, and we label our airplanes and we allow that to constrain our thinking to what we can do with that airplane. But in fact, they're all just airplanes, right? I mean, some of them are manned, some are unmanned, some fly high, some fly low, some fly fast, some fly slow, some are visible, some are invisible. Some carry a lot, some don't carry very much. I mean, they're, they've all got different attributes, but they're just airplanes, right? And so if you can take a <clears throat> C-130 and um, enable that to um, be a delivery platform for a dozen long range standoff uh, precision munitions, you know, this is the same payload that a B-52 has. You know, you, out of a 3000 foot dirt strip, uh, you can you can have uh, a long range fires platform that uh, carries uh, the same payload as as a B fifty two a C seventeen uh, which doesn't require much more than three thousand feet of dirt strip uh, can carry thirty six uh, palletized long range um, munitions and so this capability allows us to use what we already have in non traditional ways uh, to create volume of fire 
challenges for our adversaries. It also creates targeting problems too, right? I mean, it's not hard to figure out where all the 10,000 feet concrete runways in the Pacific are. Uh, but when you're trying to figure out where the 3,000 feet straight stretches of road and you know grass strips are and that kind of stuff, that's a different targeting problem for your adversaries. And so, you know, this idea of, uh, well, it's a cargo airplane, why would you be, you know, um, using it as, as a fires delivery platform? I guess I would turn the question around and say, why wouldn't you? Sure. Right. I mean, if it can do it, why wouldn't you do it? Right. And so um, pretty excited about that capability. We had a successful live fire in, uh, in December. Um, AMC and AppSoc are, are partnered on this with the Air Force Research Lab and some of our industry partners. And so uh, really kind of an exciting uh, way to open up new capabilities to, to challenge our adversaries. So pretty excited about that. On the armed Overwatch front, I think you, you saw the uh, uh, recent announcement, SOCOM, the acquisition of executives selected a, uh, uh, a platform for that. Um, what I'm looking forward to about that is seeing, um, uh, seeing that airplane operate in really, really austere uh, kinds of environment. Very, very rugged airplane, uh, exceptionally well wired, you know, a whole uh, host of, of uh, hard points on it, all uh, wired with um, uh, high end data buses. So really, you can take that airplane and, and you know, outfit it wall to wall with uh, sensors of any particular variety, munitions, a combination. Uh, it's really, really going to be flexible. And uh, our crews are pretty excited about it. Uh, as we go down into the, the squadrons that will eventually transition into this in the coming years, uh, there's, there's real uh, palpable excitement in, inside the units. And so we're looking forward to seeing it. Sounds like a great mission. You know, uh, you might talk a bit about as you transition to the peer threat uh, in, in sort of two on two vectors. One is uh, agile combat employment. And we've already talked about flying from multiple strips and creating a target problem for the bad guys because we go to so much concrete. By the way, uh, as we talked earlier, 5th Air Force and 7th Air Force proved that con construct, that concept pretty well uh, throughout World War II in the Pacific. Um, the other aspect of of that beyond agile combat support and the peer fight is the joint warfighting experience that the Air Force brings, including AFSOC, from Afghanistan. And so, as you well know, the integration of AC 130s, uh, F 15Es, uh, special ops, joint tactics folks, all in a stack running around Afghanistan going after high value targets, that experience is valuable, I would think, and I think could be applied uh, to really turning every threat into a target as we take on a peer threat. Yeah, I'll, let me talk uh, first about the agile combat employment and kind of the AFSOC manifestation of that. So <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the observations that, uh, that we've had is that, you know, really since the, I guess the end of the Cold War, uh, the Air Force has been on a, um, on, on a, a bit of a centralization drive. And, uh, you know, we, we typically centralize things because we tell ourselves it will be more efficient or there are economies of scale or we don't have enough to go around. And so we have to centralize these things. And, and when you centralize, you, trend, you tend to create functional organizations, right? And so we gather together all of our comptrollers and we put them together into a single squadron and we call it the comptroller squadron. And then we gather together all of our engineers and we put them together in a squadron. We call it the engineering squadron, civil engineering squadron. We gather together all our aircraft maintainers and we call it the aircraft maintenance squadron. Uh, and the, the challenge that we find while that has worked, um, you know, reasonably well in a static environment where we're largely not pressured by, um, by an adversary where we can operate out of, you know, fixed base infrastructures with uncontested communications. Um, the, the challenge is that's not actually how mission manifests itself, right? <clears throat> I spent several years at, at CENTCOM and in, uh, in the time that I spent at CENTCOM, we never once uh, submitted a, an RFF, a request for forces asking for the on-call comptroller squadron, you know, because we had a financial management emergency that we needed to solve in CENTCOM. 
you know, that's not the way mission comes about, right? And so the question is, how do you build teams organized around mission and not around a function, right? And so that's get kind of at the heart of how we are approaching this, uh, what the Air Force broadly calls agile combat employment, is we're building what in, inside of AFSOC we, we call mission sustainment teams. And so this is 58 airmen, uh, 19 different specialties that come together into an organization and they spend an entire force generation cycle. And I think we're gonna talk about a, you know, a, a force generation model here uh, shortly, but they go through the entire force generation cycle together. And so the, you know, the defender is no longer part of the security forces squadron. They're now part of this mission sustainment team for a whole cycle. And those 58 airmen all learn one another's uh, skills. Uh, they all uh, learn to interoperate. And critically, they learn, you know, to trust their teammates because they've been training with them for the whole cycle. They didn't just meet uh, at Bagram Air Base or Al Udeed Air Base or whatever. They, they trained together for this whole cycle. And, uh, you know, the, the sense of purpose that those airmen possess is really remarkable. Uh, every time the command chief and I uh, go visit uh, these airmen, the first question they ask is, do I have to go back to my squadron? You know, they really, really like what they're doing because they're directly connected to a mission and uh, they're challenging themselves. And uh, so I, I think this idea of mission-centric <laughs> teams is, is at the heart of our approach to Agile Company. Baths on could you build on that a little bit and your vision, especially in your CENTCOM joint warfighting experience, how what you described integrates very actively in a, in a joint old plan or a joint con ops? Well, if you think about, you know, the heart of a, of a joint task force is, is the word task, right? It's their task organized, meaning they're organized for the mission. And when you, when you stack up, what are our competitive advantages? You know, we as a nation, uh, we, possess a number of them. One of our competitive advantages is we do joint warfighting better than anybody else on the planet. And uh, inside of SOF, we do it at a lower level than anybody else, even in the, in the U.S. military. So, you know, as you know, from your, your experiences uh, while in uniform, typically in the joint force, uh, our, our joint headquarters come together at the two to three star level, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, centered around a numbered air force or a division or a corps or a MEF, you know, at that echelon, that's typically where we build joint headquarters. Uh, in SOF, we routinely do that down at the 05 and 06 level. And so the airmen and AFSOC are um, kind of jointly fluent uh, very, very early in their career because that's just the way we operate. That's absolutely a competitive advantage. You bet. Well, you already alluded to your, um, your take on a course generation model that works obviously for AFSOC uh, to give you more time to train at home, certainly work-life balance for families, um, and then obviously the demand for constant deployments. So could you talk a bit about your own AFSOC approach to really taking care of your people, keeping them ready and your fourth generation model and how there might be some translated lessons learned from how you've managed that demanding first tempo, ops tempo, uh, lessons learned for the, the broader Air Force. So AFSOC has been working uh, inside a fourth generation model for about uh, 12 years or so. Now it hasn't been until the last several years that we have aligned the entire MAGCOM on the same model. Uh, and everybody it rotates on the same date across the whole batch comp. That's only been in the last in the last several years that that's happened. But I mean, it's been a dozen years ago that we uh, recognized the value of a force generation cycle. And so you mentioned the predictability for airmen and their families and, and those types of things. And that's certainly part of it. But really, from a commander's perspective, the value of a disciplined force generation model is it allows you to articulate capacity and risk to the joint force in a way that has eluded us up to this point. And so if you think about, um, you know, I, I'll, I, I won't uh, shoot on somebody else's target. I'll, I'll use my, my own example. When I, was, uh, when I was an ops group commander, uh, we, we were 
um, kind of in the, you know, I guess to a certain extent, we still are in the more ISR, more ISR, more ISR business. And, and we had a couple of squadrons of MQ1s and MQ9s. And the question was always, hey, can you fly one more combat line for us? And, you know, how do you answer that question? You know, I, I actually have a crew here that's available and I actually have an airplane that's available and I have a ground control state. And so, I mean, the answer is yes, I can. But what I'm unable to communicate is the pressure on the force, right? I'm unable to communicate what the risk or the opportunity cost of saying, you two, go fly that airplane uh, to give them one more combat line. And we, we've been unable to talk about our capacity in a way that resonates with the joint force. It becomes too technical and, and complicated, right? Uh, and so uh, when we migrated to a four cycle force generation model, it allows us to have these conversations very unemotionally and very fact-based and allows us to articulate risk and capacity in a way that, that has really eluded us. And uh, I'll give you an example of where that uh, paid off. So last, uh, last summer, I mean, it was this, this time last year, as the uh, drawdown in Afghanistan was accelerating, we got the inevitable, um, gosh, AFSOC, we need you to send some more gunships over to CENTCOM. Um, and, you know, can you, can you deploy two more gunships? And because we had kind of worked ourselves into this force generation model, I was able to answer the question, yes, we're absolutely able to do that. Here's what it's going to cost you because you're going to pull this unit out of its generation cycle. And so here's the downstream effect of accelerating those aircraft and, and crews into, um, into their uh, deployment phase. And you know, the, part of the outcome of that was I said, uh, in the fall, we will not have any gunships available to deploy. And so uh, CENTCOM and, and the uh, joint staff uh, accepted that, the SECDEF ordered it. And so you know, we sent some more gunships to Afghanistan last summer. Uh, two of those crews won the McKay Trophy last year, uh, did fantastic work. But the key thing is, is in October of last year, for the first time in 20 years, there were no gunships in CENTCOM. For the first time in 20 years, there were no gunships in CENTCOM. And the reason that there were no gunships in CENTCOM was because we were able to articulate, you know, here is the risk that you're buying because this is what that force generation model looks like. And everybody understood that, and uh, and we accepted that risk. And so, um, you know, the the force generation model from an individual perspective, yeah, it gives you predictability and all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic, but really, it is uh, it is a governing mechanism for commanders to manage risk and uh, pressure on the force. To take that then to the next level, and a great explanation of how within limited resources, really you're responding to multiple combatant commander requirements. Um, to go somewhat uh, to the warrior statesman level, and, and I'm a huge fan, obviously, for uh, the leadership experience our airmen have, uh, senior officer level like yours. You, uh, like your uh, counterparts in other MAGCOMs, you've been all over the world, you've operated in multi-domain uh, operations, you've, you've gone fast, you've gone slow, and you just see the world in a, in a very 3D way. Uh, as airmen and warrior statesmen. So within that background, um, as certainly AFA will always advocate for dominant air and space forces, that's our job. Within that background, um, could you talk a little bit about the demand from combat commanders uh, contrasted to the resources you really need and, and the funding you need for those resources? Uh, my observation, uh, somewhat certainly uneducated, is there's more demand among combat commanders, certainly in Europe now, the Ukraine situation, uh, China, Iran is still out there, North Korea is still out there. So could you offer some perspective on how really AFA might better advocate for the air and space forces, really the numbers of airmen guardians that the nation needs, that we need for our national defense strategy, uh, that we need for our national security strategy? I, I'd be happy to. One of, <clears throat> one of the relationships that, I, that we talk about a lot inside of AFSOC uh, is 
the necessity for leaders at, at every level. So my level, you know, General Brown, uh, all the way down to our flight commanders uh, and senior NCOs, uh, have to learn that <clears throat> uh, we, we frequently talk about uh, mission and resources. We have more mission than we have airmen for, or, um, you know, we're, we're being asked to do more with less. However, this conversation manifests itself, it always comes down to mission and resources. But the, but the point that we make inside of AFSOC is there's actually a third variable. And that third variable is risk. And so there's a, always a tension between mission, risk, and resources. And so if you tell me, hey, Jim, I need you to uh, do more mission with no more resources, I can do that. It just comes with increased risk, right? Or if you tell me you're taking too much risk, I need you to reduce the level of risk you're taking, I can do that. It either means I do less mission or I need more resource, right? So, I mean, there's a three-way relationship here. And what we have to be better at is articulating risk in ways that that um, um, that are understandable to people kind of outside the bubble of, of the air and space forces, right? I mean, I think we, as airmen, we talk about it in a shorthand amongst ourselves, but when we're communicating externally, how do we talk about risk uh, in a way that, that, that ties it to mission and, and resources? So, you know, if you don't like this level of risk, you only have two choices. You know, you either have less mission or more resourcing. And so I think being able to articulate risk in ways that, that resonate, I, I think is the key. That's a great perspective. We have time now um, to step around the room um, for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, please uh, identify yourself uh, so we can record you and you can see yourself on the uh, YouTube version of the, of the product here uh, and try to keep your questions uh, relatively focused so that we can uh, get around uh, to as many of our attendees or participants as possible. And again, thank you for being here. Uh, terrific background in the room here. A lot of national security experience. Uh, and so the dialogue here, I think, can be very productive. So please, uh, let's see. Uh, let's start with, uh, is Greg Hadley here? Uh, okay. Tobias, you want to ask a question? Hi, Tobias Nagley at uh, Air and Space Forces Magazine, newly renamed. Um, you mentioned at the beginning a, a little bit about the uh, JASM coming out the back end of uh, uh, the transport aircraft. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about how you would, uh, what, what kind of transformative uh, effect that has and um, how that might be applied in different kinds of situations. So, you know, the, uh, the thing about that capability is it, it's not actually about the JASM. It's about the unconventional use of the platforms that we have available to us. And so uh, really we're, we're actually looking at other uh, types of munitions and, and capabilities. And so whether it's uh, an electronic attack capability that we might want to deploy, uh, whether it's long range uh, precision fires, I mean, you could you know, kind of use your imagination to figure out um, uh, the many things that you might do with a large volume carrier like a C-130 or a C-17. Um, in, in terms of what, <clears throat> what the challenges are that that presents, I, I, I would give you a couple. Number one, I alluded to it earlier, from a uh, targeting perspective, uh, I think an adversary has to take a, a lot different look at the region when it comes to, you know, where can we project power from? So I think that that's number one. Number two, when you look at a partner capability, uh, we have a lot of partners around the globe that don't have, um, you know, heavy bomber uh, type platforms that would be traditional carriers of, of those types of munitions, but they've got plenty of C-130s proliferated around the globe. And, a400s and you know uh, c17s and the beauty is this capability doesn't require any aircraft modifications and it doesn't require any special crew training beyond what any airdrop uh, crew already possesses and so it's really easily exportable uh, to our uh, partners and allies around the globe that may want to increase 
the utility of their air force. They just don't have the, you know, they, they don't have the big wing bomber uh, type platforms that the United States does. And so we've had a number of requests around the globe from partners to actually demonstrate this capability and to help them integrate that capability on, onto their aircraft. And so we did a uh, we did a uh, an iteration of that in the spring. We're going to do another one in the fall with partners uh, uh, around the globe. So uh, I, I would say it's really number one. It's the uh, kind of proliferation of uh, fires platforms uh, and the challenges that provides to our adversaries, uh, coupled with the um, uh, kind of um, multiplying effect that has for our partners and allies around the globe. Michael, from Inside Defense. Yes, uh, Michael Morrow from Inside Defense. Uh, so I wanted to ask about the Osprey fleet uh, stand down. Uh, so obviously that, that stand down order was lifted recently, but it seems like uh, AFSOC is taking the same approach the Marines did, uh, which the Marines, uh, when the stand down order was issued, the Marines said, We've been aware of this problem for for many years and we trained our air crews to respond so i was hoping you could talk about what conversations afsoc had with marines about the osprey issue uh and you know what factors went into your decision to lift the stand down order yeah so <clears throat> very tightly connected with uh um, general cedarholm the deputy commandant for aviation kind of the the lead aviator in the marine corps we've talked multiple times a week on this along with our uh, teammates at Nav Air and Naval Air Forces. So the Navy is now operating CMB 22s as well. So it's really three services that all operate <clears throat> different variants of, of the V-22. Uh, and so um, kind of the, the four of us at the three-star level have been connected um, uh, several times a week for, uh, for the last several weeks on this. So this, uh, um, this mechanical issue, um, you know, it's it, it's generated by a slipping sprag clutch in the um, inside the input quills on the engines. And <clears throat> if if this doesn't mean anything to you, I'd be happy to uh, draw a picture uh, because I've gotten real education on this in the last month. Uh, but <clears throat> the bottom line is when when these clutches slip, the way the V twenty two is designed, it ha it it um, has a center wing gearbox and uh, drivetrains that allow either engine to drive both prop rotors. And so if you have an engine failure, you don't have this enormous asymmetric uh, lift, asymmetric thrust uh, kind of situation. Well, when that when a clutch slips, it causes the, the you know, load to transfer to the other engine. And then when that clutch engages again, it just slips momentarily. And when it engages again, it brings that load back to the back to the original uh, motor, and those large transient torque spikes uh, exceed the exceed the limitations of the engines and the gearboxes to handle those transient uh, torque loads. And so uh, the net result of that is we've we've had 15 of these across the fleet uh, over the last dozen years or so. Four of them have been AFSOC, uh, the rest 11 have been uh, Marine. And you know we we have all understood that this is a you know that this is an actual um, mechanical problem. What has eluded us is the root cause. Why is the clutch slipping in the first place? And so uh, we we in AFSOC we've had two of these events uh, in the last couple of months now, and. Uh, so my stand down was really an opportunity for us to. Uh, uh, bring some attention to this in the engineering enterprise and with our industry partners, because the, you know, the approach up to this point has been uh, until we understand the root cause, there's really nothing we can um, do about it. And my, my view is we may not understand why it's happening, but we absolutely know what is happening. And so we need to take a closer look at what is happening and maybe uh, remove some of the um, um, uh, the precursor events to each one of these. And so when we actually looked at the data behind all, all of these, what we found was that uh, they, virtually all of them occurred in the exact same regime of flight. 
virtually all of them occurred with uh, gearboxes with the same amount of flight time on the gearboxes. And so when you start finding these patterns that say, okay, I, I don't know whether these things are directly causal or contributory or, or resultant, uh, but it's the same set of conditions every time. And so getting down to that level of analysis allowed us to modify some of our operations practices to say, okay, we're gonna put some restrictions in place <clears throat> that keep our crews out of the environments in which this is most likely to happen while we continue to search for the root cause issues. And so it was late last week that we were able to kind of hammer out the specific um, operational restrictions we were gonna put in place. And it's typically, you know, it's things like how we, uh, how we manage our power settings during takeoff, um, how frequently we, we do um, uh, um, vertical takeoffs versus uh, short uh, takeoffs. If you've got a runway available, you know, use the runway, those, those types of things. And so I feel pretty comfortable with put appropriate mitigation measures in place. We, you know, uh, in AFSOC, we haven't had a catastrophic mishap. We, like I say, we've had four of these events. Uh, each one of them is, uh, you know, uh, results in kind of a Christmas tree of lights, caution lights in the cockpit and uh, some pretty squirrely flight control inputs. Really, really proud of our crews and the way they've been able to uh, safely land these uh, airplanes. But I, I'd, I'd rather they not have to demonstrate their superior skill uh, because we put superior controls in place to prevent them from having to do that. Thanks, sir. Ma'am. Hi, sir. Good morning. Hey, Thanks good morning. for your time today. I'm Kimberly Underwood from Signal Magazine. And I wanted to ask about um, Agile Combat Employment and your mission-centric teams. What are your plans for FY23? How will you further their development? Um, kind of any exercises or other things you'll be involved in? And are you looking at, assuming there's nothing in the fridge, any emerging technologies that will support them, um, either C2 or other uh, emerging technologies? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So, <clears throat> You know, one of the, uh, so in terms of plans for 23, we continue to generate these things uh, in, in our host wings. And so we've got a couple of, of host installation wings, which, you know, back to this conversation we had earlier about mission risk and resources. I've obviously asked more of these, uh, of these organizations that are producing those, you know, 58 airmen at a time to go do that, right? I've, I've said, hey, I need you to do this other thing as well and I'm gonna take 58 airmen away from you. So that drives risk into their other day-to-day -day operations. And uh, so we're, we're gonna to continue to do that while looking for ways to mitigate the risk that we're driving into the organization. They're already pretty uh, um, heavily employed right now as this capability becomes a little more mature, it is uh, becoming a, um, in demand uh, across our force. Everybody wants to deploy with their own, you know, mission sustainment team, uh, it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting. Um, but it, uh, in terms of the equipping, one of the things that <clears throat> centralization uh, does, does for you, and so I, you know, I'm really on a kind of a, a jihad here against centralization uh, inside of AFSOC. One, one of the evils of centralization is it masks your shortages, right? And so uh, I've got, you know, four units uh, that each need a teleportation device, but I only have three teleportation devices. And so I'm gonna centralize them all into the teleportation squadron, right? And uh, what we find is it's not until we actually require, uh, you know, uh, maximum effort of deploying all four of those units that I find out that I'm short one teleportation device. And so when we organize around missions, what we're doing is we're highlighting the shortages that we have. And one of the key shortages that we have is we've underinvested in our tactical comm uh, equipment. And you know, while we have had enough to operate out of fixed bases where there's already you know, infrastructure in place and all you gotta do is plug in, you know, all the equipment's already there, that's not what the future environment looks like. And so what we're realizing is we've got some significant investments that we need to make in tactical communications. And I would tell you, you know, kind of the, the key area that we're looking for there is uh, software defined um, capabilities. I mean, there's a proliferation of waveforms in use across the battlefield. And as a, 
you know, as the air component of SOCOM, I have to interoperate with, you know, everything from a Green Beret team to a SEAL platoon to a group of uh, a special tactics team. They all have different mission requirements and they all have different uh, communications equipment. And I have to be able to uh, seamlessly interoperate with every one of them, pass data at high bandwidth back and forth. Uh, and so that that's really where our focus area is, but it's uh, closing the gaps that our, our shared shortages have uh, highlighted for us. Great, others. Please, sir. Uh, good morning, General. Uh, thanks for the opportunity today. Uh, I'm a retired COSI uh, helicopter pilot, so it's great to see a helicopter pilot up there sitting. So, um, I'm with an advanced AI company right now. We're actually going to be doing JFTX with uh, you know AFSOC here shortly. But it leads me to my question. You know, with the inflection point that you talked about earlier, you know, moving to the great power competition with China. Um, how important are the advanced AI sensors and those kind of things for the future of AFSOC? Well, uh, great question. W one of the things that we, uh, uh, an idea that we are uh, pursuing inside of AFSOC is a, uh, what we are beginning to talk about as uh, um, our adaptive airborne enterprise. And I'll, I'll just kind of give you the, the broad outlines of this, but it, it gets directly to your question. <clears throat> so if you think back, and this is really driven by our, our unmanned, uh, you know, um, suite of platforms, so everything from MQ-9 all the way down to much smaller uh, platforms. You know, when we got into the, um, a, as an Air Force, when we got into the remotely piloted uh, aircraft business in the 1990s, we did it the way that you might expect the Air Force to do it, right? We have an airplane. Well, if you have an airplane, what do airplanes need? Airplanes need pilots. Okay, well then let's have a pilot for the airplane. Uh, well, I've got a pilot in an airplane. What do pilots need in airplanes? Well, pilots need cockpits. Okay, well, we'll build a cockpit for the pilot. And so we built this you know, ground control station and called it a cockpit and uh, we put a pilot in it. And if you have a pilot in a cockpit flying an airplane, what kind of things do pilots do in cockpits that fly airplanes? Well, they climb and descend and take off and land and turn left and turn right. And they memorize emergency procedures and they memorize uh, exhaust gas temperature limits and you know, uh, RPM limitations. And you know, that's what pilots do when they're in cockpits flying airplanes. And that model, one pilot, one cockpit, one data link to one airplane, that model has persisted now for the better part of 30 years. And uh, AI and automation have advanced to the point where a lot of that is not actually required. You know, that's a very manpower intensive methodology for operating aircraft. And so uh, one of the things we're looking at is moving to an open architecture uh, control layer uh, that has the ability to control multiple platforms, multiple types. It's really platform agnostic with an operator, not necessarily a pilot, an operator, and not one operator per aircraft, but one operator, a control layer with multiple uh, types of, of platforms on the other end of the data links. Uh, that is all here and now. I mean, none of that is you know, futuristic, has to be developed low TRL, I mean, all of that is here and now stuff. It's a matter of bringing it together uh, into, a, into a logical architecture. And uh, we're, we're actually moving uh, pretty quickly down that, uh, down that path inside of, uh, inside of AFSOG. Um, but 100% of that is dependent on automation and AI at the, at the platform level, at the edge, if you will, where you know, I don't need to know how to take off and land the airplane, but the airplane has to know how to take off and land the airplane. I don't need to know, um, you know, how to um, track a vehicle with a sensor, but the airplane has to know how to track a vehicle with a sensor. Again, all of that is here and now, but we have to bring it together into a coherent architecture. So uh, very dependent on automation and AI kind of at the, at the tactical edge. I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Burke, uh, 
I have time for a couple of questions, uh, not to ambush you, Joe, but he's one of our AFA board members. So one of the reasons I want you all to know him is he's always recruiting uh, for new chapter leadership uh, across certainly Virginia and around, around the country. So Joe, comments or questions? Get a microphone for you. I think this is a great event. Uh, I'd like to see how the how you're gonna land, land an AC-130 on the water. Uh, so me um, too, <laughs> sir. But uh, um, uh, you know uh, we do uh, need uh, volunteers here in Northern Virginia. So uh, I'm in one of the chapters in Northern Virginia, also on the board. Uh, so if anyone's interested in helping us out as volunteers, uh, we could always use your help. Um, and I don't have anything else for the general other than, you know, I'd love to see a picture of that or see, uh, be there and the, when the demonstration happens, when you do the first test flight. So thanks, Joe. Uh, other questions, sir, please, sir. Yes, sir. Right next. Oh, sure. Uh, just to follow up on that. What is the testing plan for the floats on the C-130? And, and then and just to follow up on Michael's question, um, there is a CB-22 abandoned right now on an island in Norway, it, it seems, um, uh, so was this linked to that problem and what's the plan for recovering it? Yeah, the, the abandoned would be, uh, that, that probably not the right verb uh, for that B-22, but yeah, they, uh, that, that's exactly right. In uh, Northern Norway, near the coast, uh, one of, we had one of these uh, hard clutch engagement events, the, the air crew put it down. And so uh, we're, in the, we're in the midst of kind of a recovery process to get that, uh, to get that airplane to a place where we can swap out the engines and the gearboxes and all the things that need to be replaced. So that's kind of underway right now. Um, these things, uh, you know, never seem to happen at uh, airfields. Um, you know, they always seem to happen in Norwegian nature preserves above the Arctic circle at the onset of winter. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's provided a, a really great tactical problem for that, uh, for that unit to, figure out what to do with that airplane out in the middle of a, a nature preserve with protected ferns and, and uh, salamanders and things like that. So <clears throat> uh, with respect to the, um, the amphibious uh, capability on an MC-130, I, I will say uh, don't have any plans to land a gunship on the water. The, you know, the weight and the center of gravity is a little bit different on that. It's really uh, for our MC-130s, but we're already uh, going through the tank testing right now. We've got a we've got 100% digital design. We you know we started out with a number of digital designs. We ran through a um, a series of testing to figure out you know do we want to do the, a catamaran, a pontoon, a, a hull uh, applique on the bottom of the air. I mean we kind of went through all the iterations of that, and we settled on a design that you know provides the best. Uh, trade-off of, uh, of, of drag, weight, um, you know, uh, sea state performance, all, all those types of things. And so we've, we've got 100% design done. Uh, we're going through the, um, uh, the wave tank uh, testing right now. Everything has uh, so far tested out just kind of pretty much the way uh, the, way the digital design uh, was predicted to uh, perform. And so uh, I think we're going to have our first um, construction of this. And so the idea here, this, it, it's an amphibious modification. It's not a uh, float plane. You know, it, it has the ability, it will have the ability to land on, on both land or, or water. And uh, it'll be a, it'll be a field installable uh, modification kit. And so, it, you know, it won't be every airplane. It won't be all the time. Uh, it'll be a capability that's available uh, to the fleet. And I think we're going to, um, start um, aircraft integration in 23. Outstanding. We have time for uh, one more question, and then uh, we're going to wrap it up. Please, right, right here on the end. Good morning, sir. Brad Grain from Ball Aerospace. Thanks for your time today. Um, General Braga recently spoke about some of the synergies between soft, cyber, and space. I was wondering if you could talk about what FSOC's doing in that realm. Thank you. Yeah, this is something that... Uh, um, so I'm, I'm now in my, uh, uh, I'm past my fifth year of going to SOCOM commander conferences and, and so forth. And a common theme for the last five years inside of SOCOM 
has been uh, kind of the magic that occurs uh, at this intersection of soft space and and cyber capabilities. And you know, if you uh, if you think about it, uh, while the U.S. Space Command actually has it, it is a geographic combatant command, right? So the Unified Command Plan describes Space Command as a geographic combatant command, meaning it, it has an area of responsibility, and that's all you know, above a certain altitude and, and so forth. But generally speaking, the, these three, Cybercom, SOCOM, and SpaceCom, are all uh, combatant commands that have global responsibilities, right? And so it's not constrained to this continent or this chunk of the Earth's surface, but th these three combatant commands all have global responsibilities. And so, um, and much of, much of the, you know, defining security challenges transcend GCC boundaries, right? I mean, I, you know, the um, uh, threats don't stop at a GCC's boundary and say, no, we're going to contain ourselves to CENTCOM or AFRICOM or UCOM or whatever. They, they tend to be trans-regional in nature. And so these three combatant commands have global responsibilities. And so there is an opportunity to kind of bring those three together uh, to address some of these uh, trans-regional challenges. The question then becomes, how do you do it? You know, what, at, at the tactical level, how do you do it? In, inside of AFSOC, our answer to that, we, you know, I, again, back to the decentralization and focusing around mission, uh, we're, we're building, um, in each of our wings, we're building uh, units that have a heavy intelligence, analytic, multi-source intelligence uh, capability and have uh, some of our more high-end soft capabilities embedded inside those units, uh, along with um, teammates from uh, both the Space Force um, and, um, and Cybercom uh, embedded in those, in those units. And so that synergy uh, can take place not at a kind of a ethereal level, but down at a tactical level, solving, you know, problems uh, that are um, uh, that are kind of much more uh, locally, um, locally focused. And so I, I, our first one of those is uh, being established in, um, in the European Command AOR right now. And some of the initial challenges that they're working on uh, inside that that uh, part of the world, uh, really, um, some pretty impressive work coming out of that organization. But it's the it's the synergy of intelligence, information. Uh, we've got a healthy IO uh, piece to that organization, um, space, cyber, and soft. Those things all coming together, kind of at a very tactical level. Well, thanks, Jim. And as we wrap up, uh, I would remind uh, everyone that. Uh, you have the opportunity to see and hear General Slife uh, again during our Airspace and Cyber Conference, 19 through 21 September at the Gaylord, at the Gaylord Conference Center. Jim's going to be on the stage with Lieutenant General Ginkowicz from CENTAF and General Hecker from USAFE, and they're going to talk about countering the Russian threat, uh, getting to our earlier discussions about AFSOC and the peer threat fight. So uh, I encourage you, uh, if you're not already signed up, it looks like we're going to have the largest uh, airspace and cyber conference, AFA airspace and cyber conference we've had in many years with some 14,000 uh, attendees. And of course, we're going to live stream uh, to those uh, enemies of our nation uh, just to make the point we're undaunted. But if you could, Jim, just to wrap up um, the McKay Trophy that your crew won, uh, could you talk just a little bit about them from the perspective of their dad, if you will? Uh, I'm sure with a little bit of pride about that crew and just what they did. My point would only be, and you've heard me say this before, our airmen and guardians are the most lethal force and the more capable lethal joint force. Uh, we can't advocate enough for them, so please. Yeah, but we, <clears throat> I, I am incredibly proud of, of those two gunship crews. And, you know, it was, uh, they were covering the, the evacuation of Kabul. And uh, one of the things that I, we kind of talk about inside of AFSOC, and I certainly tell our, our gunship squadrons that the you know the the uh, most impressive part of the gunship is not the 
105 millimeter cannon or the, you know, um, small diameter bombs on the wings or the hellfires or the battle management system. It's the, it's the crew. And if you ever, if you ever hop in the back of a gunship and put a headset on and listen to the orchestration of the uh, communication going on inside the airplane as they manage, uh, as they manage uh, the mission. I mean, it is impressive. I can't, I can't keep up. I just kind of, you know, clap uh, is really about all I can uh, do when that happens. And, you know, as those crews were covering the evacuation of Kabul, the, the thing that was most impressive to me was the discipline that, that those crews had. And so one of the, one of the capabilities that uh, we put on our um, several of our platforms um, a dozen years or so ago was uh, what we kind of affectionately refer to as the green beam. And, uh, you know, the green beam is essentially a giant, you know, green laser pointer. Uh, and, you know, the, the point of the green beam is to serve as a uh, deterrent. And um, it, it's not necessarily to point things out to the friendlies. It's to let the, adversar uh, let the adversaries know that uh, you see them. And uh, so, you know, that it's not a particularly, um, it's not a particularly popular capability among the crews because, uh, you know, the other end of that green beam is connected to me, right? And I don't necessarily want to highlight my position like that. Uh, but, uh, but those crews were really, really um, creative in how they were managing a very chaotic situation on the ground, communicating uh, with the forces on the ground, using the green beam to point out uh, um, adversaries that, hey, you know, we know you're there and you're in our crosshairs. And uh, um, the, the discipline that those crews um, uh, demonstrated in kind of managing a very chaotic situation on the ground, building the situational awareness for the force on the ground and keeping the adversaries kind of pushed back while the evacuation was underway. Uh, it's really, really remarkable. The best, best part of a gunship is the crew. It's not the, it's not the airplane. With that, uh, please, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Lieutenant General Jim Slife and all the members of APSOC for what you do for our nation. Thank you.